sadly. Um, people and the, both the Democrats and the Republican parties are figuring out that local politics is where it's at. And especially if we've been paying attention to what's happening in the Texas legislature, and it's been happening every legislative session for the past four or five sessions, there is a continual erosion of local power in local governments, and it's all being subsumed into the state because that's where the power is. You're also seeing that there is a much um, greater level of involvement from, from statewide politicians in the, local in the local elections. You're seeing endorsements from, from, from United States senators in school board races, for heaven's sakes. That's where they're grooming, um, that's where they're grooming their politicians and, and grooming future office holders to continue to, um, to build on their mantras and their ideologies. So local elections are incredibly important and, the, and this is where the forward party can really make a difference because I think as people in local municipalities begin to wake up to what's happening, and I think they're waking up more and more, they're going to take their elections back. And I think we can play a role in that. I hope. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to the Texas Forward Podcast. Emily Spivak and I decided to uh, do a little swap today, and I'm very glad she did because this was just a fantastic conversation that Emily had with Laura Wheat. Laura worked in the nonprofit sector for 16 years. She earned her law degree from the Maryland School of Law. She was the mayor of Westlake, and with that, the president of Westlake Academy. Laura has sat on countless boards, including the chairman for the Gladney Center for Adoption. She's currently on the executive committee for the Texas Forward Party, co-CEO of Joanna Check, and a three-time cancer survivor. This was a fantastic episode. Hope you enjoy. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to go that extra mile for the forward party, share this with a friend. We really appreciate your support and hope you enjoy the episode. Laura Wheat, thank you so much for coming on the show today. A pleasure to be here. And thank you to you guys. You're, you're an inspiration, truly. Thank you for saying that. I'm Emily Spivak, your host today. This is the Texas Forward Party podcast. So Laura, can you tell us what drew you to the Forward Party and what inspired you to get involved? Oh my goodness. Probably like all of us, right? Um, just being so disillusioned with where we are today. Um, just seeing that no one's talking to one another, that we're not making progress in any form or fashion, that whatever party's in power, they're going to put their stamp on things without any consideration to other voices that may be in the room or at the table. That's just not the way to run a railroad. And just feeling tremendously, um, oh, Unimportant's not the right word. Um, just, just not having a voice. And we can do better. I really believe we can do better. I'm so tired of all the negativity. I'm tired of the personality bashing. I'm tired of avoiding issues. I'm tired of not solving problems. And if we continue down this path with just two entrenched choices, I don't think we're going to change things. So Forward offers an alternative. I love that. Yes, I agree. So tired of just not finding solutions, right. not focusing on what needs to get done. Right. And, 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 and too much negativity, for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> Where do you think the Ford Party fits in in this state of politics? Well, at the moment, <laughs> we're growing. What we're doing is really, really hard. Um, there's one thing that both of the traditional uh, extreme parties, Democrats and Republicans agree on, and that is that they do not want a third party, right? Okay. So right now where we fit in is working to become a disruptor. And we're not looking to take over the world. What we're looking to do is to spark conversation. 
and to get people to the table where they have to look each other in the eye and talk about issues. That's what we're about. Yes. Get off social media and talk to one yes, another. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I love that. As you know, uh, the Texas Forward Party is officially registered here in Texas, yep. um, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But we still have two very big hurdles to overcome. One being the 90,000 plus signatures mm -hmm. we're going to need in a very small time. I think it's right. maybe two months. Um, right. And then we also are going to need to get our candidates on yeah. the, the ballot. Or, excuse me that those 90,000 signatures will get our candidates on the ballot. Correct. Um, because just because we're a registered party, we still cannot put candidates on the ballot. Correct. Um, so, you know, our second hurdle is finding candidates that will trust us enough yeah. that we're going to get those signatures and that we're going to get on the ballot. Right. I know that you have a stint in local politics. Right. Um, so how did you get involved? And um, what encouragement would you give to potential candidates <laughs> who are on the fence? Um, yeah. You know, like getting involved at the, the local level, like the school board, you know, right. it, it's just, it all matters. The first question is so much easier to answer than the second question because things have changed so much, really. I was mayor of the town of Westlake for 14 years long time. Um, 2000, I got, I was first elected in 2008. That was a lifetime ago for many people, for, for you all, I'm sure. <laughs> In any event, um, I got involved because I, there was, there was a need. Um, we, as the town of Westlake, we own and operate a charter school, Westlake Academy, um, Westlake Academy was formed to be a unifier in the town of Westlake because we're divided among three different school districts. And it turned out to be a divider. So um, I felt like I, given my not-for-profit background and, and my legal background, I felt like I could make a difference. I had been bringing parties together, literally getting people to the table to talk with one another so that we could hear each other's um, viewpoints and and figure out how we move forward. My mantra became, we're in the school business, like it or not, right? We can't, we, it's not something you get out of without disrupting hundreds of lives, literally. So, so that's why I ran. And I, I felt like I could make a difference, and I believe I did. Um, so that was, it was a wonderful experience. I loved virtually every day. Oh, <laughs> I love that. But you asked me about so. what encouragement would I give? for people who are on the fence about running. To be, to be frank, I wouldn't run <laughs> because I'm, I'm concerned that even as wonderful as the forward party is, it's still politics. And my skin, I just know firsthand, is not that thick. So you do need, you do need a bit of a thick skin. Social media has changed everything. Um, when, you are, so, when something is said about you on social media, you really don't get to combat it very effectively, um, so it's it's a difficult a difficult place to be. But there are I think there are young people out there who are used to these landmines. Frankly, they're growing up with these landmines, and we have a few candidates and potential candidates involved with the Forward Party who are going in with eyes wide open, and they get it, and they will they'll stand up to the heat in the kitchen, and and I believe too that they are equipped and will support them in continuing to be equipped with the ability to remain um, full of integrity, integrity-based, integrity-based, and to approach things from a respectful position. And, and that's where I'd head. So. Yes, I think um, on our last podcast, we had a, a guest from a PR firm, Dylan, and um, he was saying, the fight's going to come to you. It's how you fight, how yes. you respond. Yes. And I think um, people that have grown up in the social media environment might be able to handle it. Navigate it. Navigate better. it because it's always been what yes. they've known, right? Yes. So, I can't yes. imagine being a middle schooler today. Oh, oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. I, I yeah. just not looking forward to yeah. navigating that with my children. <laughs> I mean, my... Seven-year-old already wants a phone, yes. and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> well, social media is a game changer. Oh, yes, yeah. for sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of local elections? Oh, yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> um, frankly, in 2008, 
I didn't get it. I didn't understand really the importance of local politics. I didn't really understand that local politics is the place where you can make a real difference. Sadly, um, people and the, both the Democrats and the Republican parties are figuring out that local politics is where it's at. And especially if you've been paying attention to what's happening in the Texas legislature, and it's been happening every legislative session for the past four or five sessions, there is a continual erosion of local power in local governments, and it's all being subsumed into the state because that's where the power is. You're also seeing that there is a much um, greater level of involvement from, from statewide politicians in the, local in the local elections, you're seeing endorsements from, from, from United States senators in school board races, for heaven's sakes. That's where they're grooming, um, that's where they're grooming their politicians and, and grooming future office holders to continue to, um, to build on their mantras and their ideologies. So local elections are incredibly important and, the, and this is where the forward party can really make a difference because I think as people in local municipalities begin to wake up to what's happening, and I think they're waking up more and more, they're going to take their elections back. And I think we can play a role in that. I hope that you're correct. Yes. Because, yes, watching the school boards, I mean, I think we see it all playing yeah. out and, um, and the players getting involved and what's happening in, in the legislature with Houston right now. Yes. And, um, yeah, I think that we have a couple of bills out there that we're um, trying to fight. <laughs> well, you've got to get people to the voting booth. Yes. That's, that's a huge problem. We've got, what, 5% of the electorate el electing people? I mean, and if you're not in, an, in a, a presidential cycle, the number of people who vote is just embarrassing. I hope through electoral reform, yes. it will encourage people yeah. to come back. And that, you know, that is the key to democracy yes. is, is you have to be engaged yeah. and, or it's not going to work. Well, so, I look at the forward yes. party, I say this a lot, that we're the, we're the home for the politically homeless and we're hope for the politically hopeless. Uh, yes. So if we can, if we can inspire hope um, in folks and make them feel and make them understand that truly their vote does matter and it. And in local politics, your vote matters. Um, and get them to the, uh, the voting booth and in the habit of voting will all be better served. Hope for the politically hopeless. hopeless. I love it. <laughs> yes, I love that so much. So how did being mayor mm -hmm. um, shape your out outlook on mm. politics? Uh, yeah. I know, and I know it was a lifetime ago. <laughs> Um, well, my term, words, well my term just ended last, my, my, my political career ended last May. So it's, I haven't been out of it that long. Um, I was just in it for a long time. I was awakened to politics. I, I didn't get it. I, wouldn't, I would have been one of those being confused by, what do you mean the state's trying to take away local control? What is local control? I, I didn't understand those things, and I understand them now in a really big way. And I also, I also like to think that, especially at the local level, people are coming from a good place. I don't see, um, I don't, I don't see a boogeyman behind every corner. I, I, I think that people are in there and want to do a good job, just don't necessarily know how to do it. I, I like to think that's the case in any event. Yeah, and I like to think that, um, you know, it, it, I'm glad to hear you say that, right? Because yeah. it makes it okay if for you to dip your, to like dip your toes in, yes. right? And just try it out. If you yeah. think it, if you, you're being called to run or you yes. think that you might want to do it, yeah. it's okay if you don't know everything. Yes. Because there's no better way to learn, right? <laughs> and, and believe me, nobody knows it. Yes. If they don't know it. Fortunately, I had an amazing mentor in the form of a town manager. His name was Tom Brimer, is Tom Brimer. Um, he was able to show me the way in many respects, and I think I was able to teach him things too. Um, it was a great relationship, but I couldn't have told you when I took the job why a town manager was important. Well, I sure know now. So. Yeah, I think we touched on that. Yes, yeah. there's, there's a lot involved. Exactly, there. exactly. <laughs> Backing up to a time long before you were mayor, yes, um, you started your career as a corporate lawyer, yes, 
And then you left and you entered into the world of philanthropy mm -hmm. and nonprofits. Um, what drove you towards leadership in these areas and how did you get involved? <laughs> well, I was a um, mergers and acquisitions lawyer practicing in Dallas. And I was first uh, diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 30. Uh, and I honestly just thought that was a blip on the radar screen. I'd do my, you know, take my medicine, do chemo and radiation, and then I'd be back in the saddle in no time. And that's pretty much the way it sorted out. Um, but then I got breast cancer again when I was 32. It's like, uh-oh, <laughs> this could be more serious than I might have thought. Um, so more medicine, you know, more uh, chemotherapy. Couldn't do radiation that time since I'd already done it once before. But um, all of a sudden, whether or not that registration statement got filed on Friday or Monday, I really didn't care. <laughs> just, yes. It just didn't matter so much to me anymore. And, and fortunately, I was in a position where um, I had just been recently married and, and my husband was actively encouraging me to like slow down. And that's how I found my way into the not-for-profit world. I, I still wanted to contribute. Um, so I started honestly driving the van at the Ronald McDonald House of Dallas on Fridays. Um, I had a chemo on Monday generally, and then by Friday I was feeling better. So would drive the van, and then they, one thing led to another. They asked me to serve on their board, and <laughs> so it just grew from there. I ended up chairing that board for a number of years, and and doing their fundraiser, local fundraiser, a number of times, um, and. And just one thing led to another. And from there, I went to St. Philip's School and Community Center in South Dallas, a wonderful experience. And, and then uh, uh, to what was then called Gilda's Club, we opened up the first Gilda's Club for um, cancer survivors and those supporting people um, living with cancer. Um, and that's now Cancer Support Community. So I also worked with Cancer Support Community on a national level. Yeah. Wonderful. It sounds like it was um, a way for you to keep your identity yes. and something to yeah. really hold on to when you're going through such a difficult time. And I have to tell you too, I didn't realize it at the time, but there's politics in everything. <laughs> yes. So when the whole mayor thing came up, I really, I really believed, and I think it was true, proved to be true, that the experience that I had, that I had from these different leadership roles in these different not-for-profit organizations would serve me well there. And, and they really did. So... That's wonderful. Yeah. Switching gears a yeah. bit, but not too much, yeah. because I know that um, as part of this, you eventually um, got involved with the Gladney Center. Yes. And um, unfortunately, here in Texas, we are not known for our stellar foster care system. No. And while I know that Gladney is an adoption agency. Right. Um, I also realize they've been around for over a hundred years. That's right. I think 135. Yes, 135. <laughs> I mean, yeah. for a very long yeah. time. Yeah. And they seem to have always had an innovative mm -hmm. spirit, mm -hmm. like constantly advocating for children and having them and their families at the forefront of mm -hmm. everything that they do. Um, and I understand that Gladney is once again creating a program that assists with Fostering children, yes. not just adoption. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the Gladney Center, sure. how you got involved, if you and you know some of their wonderful oh, programs? I would love to. Thank you for that. Um, it is the Gladney Center for Adoption, and it has been around for over 135 years. And and you were so kind to acknowledge that we've always had what's in the best interests of children at the forefront of our mission, and it, it remains there to this day. But that doesn't mean we've been perfect. There things have changed, and what we were doing uh, maybe. 30 years ago, which we believe to be in the best interest of children, may, with the benefit of hindsight, not have been such a great thing. Like, you, you look at interracial adoptions and, and, and our um, lack of understanding about the kind of support that would be required in that situation. Or you look at international adoptions, the same thing. I mean, there's, so it's been interesting to see that adoption in some levels is controversial. Um, certainly that's, again, <laughs> I'm, I'm always learning new things, right? Wow, okay, I understand that. Um, very proud of what Gladney is doing now. We were the only uh, remaining adoption agency that had a maternity home. And a maternity home was just like what it sounds, a place for unwed moms um, to come and wait for their time to deliver. 
and a safe and, and loving environment. Well, as society has changed, there's just not a need for maternity homes anymore. And so we had all this unused space. Well, uh, you know, wringing of hands at the board level and at the staff level, like, what do we do with this space? And and where's the real need here? Well, wow, in Texas, as anywhere else, really, we're show me the state that has that is handling this foster care issue well. I, I'm, I'm not aware. But in Texas in particular, we have a huge um, foster care crisis. So what Gladney did, um, they, certi- they got themselves certified to become a foster home for girls at the lowest level of care. So we're not licensed for, for, for young women who, who need more advanced levels of care. But for this lowest level of care and, and sticking true to our mission of adoption, um, girls generally between the ages of 13 and 18 who are still hoping um, to find a forever family in the form of adoption. So we are we have opened our doors to those girls and we now have basically a full maternity home. And when we have had some wonderful success stories in terms of finding forever families for those girls. And the idea is that if that doesn't work for whatever reason, they always have Gladney to fall back on. I love that so much yeah. because the statistics show that that is the most vulnerable oh. population um, for in the foster care system. Yes, because you know if they turn eighteen and they have no one, Nowhere where do go. they go? I mean, yeah. you know, in Texas, people like to say, you know, you can pull yourself up with, by your bootstraps, but the truth is, you can only do that if you have somebody behind you helping you pull those up. I mean, and you need boots. You yes, yes. and you need boots. <laughs> yes, I mean, you have to have the support system. Yes, yes. So um, I we have one young woman so who's at the University of North Texas, and I would say that. University of North Texas does a great job for for kids coming out of the foster care system. Um, They embrace them. There are programs for them specifically at University of North Texas, so bear that in mind. Um, I also want to say, again, being just proud of Gladney, um, they they recognize that counseling, that everyone in the adoption triad, you know, birth parents and, and adoptive parents and adoptees, we can all benefit from counseling. It, but but especially people who are both in the foster care system and those who are supporting them in the foster care system. And and so Gladney is is being very intentional about creating counseling programs for everyone who are impacted by adoption. So very exciting. That is exciting. I personally believe that we all need a therapist. Yes. <laughs> to call. I agree. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. No. Um, somebody to support you and have in a yeah. corner and then you know, trauma is trauma no matter what it is. And That's so, right. so, yes, I think yeah. that that is so good. And I did not know that about University of North Texas. Yes. That is my alma mater. Oh, so good. that's wonderful. <laughs> so yes. yes, cheers to them. Um, yes, very that's awesome. impressive. I'm glad that they're spending that yes. well. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give to someone navigating, you know, the adoption mm-hmm. system in 2023 or... Yeah. You know, the or the foster care. Yeah. You know. Wow. What <laughs> honestly, I would first place I'd do first thing I'd do is call Gladney. I do think they do it right. Um social media, we've talked already how it's a game changer in the in the field of politics. It is a game changer in the field of adoption as well. Lots of resources out there. Um, you know, foster care is still uh, governed by our state legislature. So if that's an if that's something that interests you um, you're going to need to get connected. A, a Gladney or another agency will help you do that and help navigate those waters. Um, the, I would, uh, if you're looking for advice, be prepared. Um, in, in adopting out of the foster system, these kids, even at the the lowest level of need, oh my goodness, the stories that they tell, they're heartbreaking. You, it's hard to get your head around it. And what happens is a society, we tend to blame these kids. And how awful is that? But, but do know there are going to be challenges ahead. And, and you know, staying focused on the fact that you're doing this out of love, um, that would be my advice. So. Often, um, yeah, I think we forget that they're kids yes. and they... They didn't do they, this. They, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I love, you know, that, yes, you have to remember why you're why doing, you're doing it. it. Yeah. And, and it's not going to yes. be perfect. It's yes. not going to be pretty. Um, you will second guess yourself. I have a number of friends who have been down this path and and it's it's very tough. My understanding is it's a hard, hard thing. Yes, yes. it is. It is. Um, 
What's a, a misconception I, about adoption that you would like to debunk? And I think you kind of just touched yeah. on one, which yeah. is that, you know, some of these kids have a difficult past, which makes yeah. for a difficult present. Yes. Um, is there is there something else? Oh, I, I mentioned counseling. I just naively thought that because we went through an agency that was so well-respected and um, and, and we just ended up with these two perfect boys, um, that there couldn't, there couldn't be any issues that related to adoption. I would hear about adoption trauma, and I'd think, oh, well, that's somebody else. <laughs> that's not a Gladney baby. I have Gladney babies. Well, it turns out um, that adoption, ad adoption is trauma in its own way, regardless of whether or not you were an infant when you were adopted or five or 10 or, or 15, um, it's different. It, and my husband and I are challenge each other and facing that, that our young men, our 25 and 28 year old, have their own issues when it comes to adoption. And they could benefit from some of that counseling. And, and we've obviously, they've grown up knowing that they were adopted, but we didn't look at it in terms of, wow, let's, let's talk about issues that may be surrounding, let, let's unpack some of those as opposed to just glossing over it. So we're just now getting that to that in our family. And in fact, with, ex with respect to one son, this will be the first time he's really heard about it. <laughs> I imagine that is so challenging because, yeah. you know, adoption is still adoption, but family life is still family life. Yes. And, and you have all of the everyday yeah. struggles that you're trying to get through. Yes. So then just adding, um, like, when do you find the time to, to really dive in right. and, and, and do all that extra stuff? So, and, it, it, yeah. you know, for me, it wasn't necessarily about time, but it was all going it's all going so well and yes. and they're just great guys yes right <laughs> but but they're not the, you know when it comes to like the the dreaded exercise in an adoptive family is when they come home and they're supposed to be doing their family tree like oh oh, oh what are we yes. going to do now right yes so, but but that's those are fair questions and and when you look at things like um you know what 23 and me and those genetic tests right now like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to think about that, <laughs> you know? but that's not fair to them yeah. because they come to the table with a set of genes that aren't mine. Right. And, and they should feel free to explore. And my one son, my oldest son, adopted son is, um, has, has met his birth mom is very, um, good friends with his, uh, with his half sibling, biological half sibling. Um, my, my youngest son hasn't had that experience yet. And I hope for him one day it does happen because yeah. I think there's a nice, closure to that. Yes. It's a little tough for me at the beginning. Yes. Like, where do I fit in here? Yes. But I think I've adjusted. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, that's, that's wonderful. And yeah, I know 23andMe and all of those are controversial in themselves. Yes. How much do you want to know? And, and designer babies and yeah. And, and well, and also, you know, people oh, yeah. believe the private, that they have their privacy, privacy and all of that. <clears throat> but yeah. Um, wow, is it cool? I mean, they can tell you <laughs> so much about yeah. your history and how far back. And I haven't you know, done it it's yet. It's very, it's I, it's very cool. So um, you can learn. All, you know, if you if you have a predisposition to liking chocolate, I wow, mean, like, okay, okay, like wow, you know, well, if you're gonna I definitely have, a sweet have cute, one of those. Know? So <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, pretty amazing. So. Before we wrap up, is there a question that you really wanted to answer, but I did not ask? Question? I, oh, that's a... I've never been asked that question before. Um, gosh. I, I guess I would just, wrapping it, bringing it back around to, to the forward party, uh, I, I alluded to the fact earlier that this is a difficult thing that we're doing, but we have to do it, Right. Um, and I just look forward to the day when we have millions of followers and supporters. And I look forward to the day when we can have difficult conversations about difficult topics and not leaving the room feeling, feeling either villainized or victimized, um, that we can, we can make forward progress along those lines. 
I love that. I can't wait to celebrate with you when yes, that happens. Yes. Um, and yes, it's gonna it's gonna be a lot of work, but I think that we can do it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your efforts. Really, I'm just I you are an you are an inspiration. You and your team, you are an inspiration with the, all of the volunteer hours. You all have like real day jobs, and and this is a labor of love. You're and so I'm kind, so appreciative. Yes, Thank you're you. so kind. We are loving what we do, and but you know we really appreciate you saying that. <laughs> So, Laura, we did mention that you are part of the Texas Ford Executive Committee. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's been like for you and what you are currently working on? Sure. Uh, I got involved with the Texas Forward Party through one of our legacy parties, which was SAM, the Serve America Movement. And I was originally recruited... Um, by one of our um, SAM Texas leaders to work with lo local candidates and through local, you know, electoral bodies um, to spread the forward word. And there has been a little bit of that going on. But since we, since SAM and forward merged, um, my role has morphed somewhat into more of a communications role. I am thrilled to be working on, you know, some documentation things, takeaways, take giveaways to get people informed as to what the Forward Party is all about. I've actually been uh, working on creating um, some documentation as to how you host a, a Forward Party um, to help spread the word, uh, what it looks like to bring groups of people together and what the flow should be. Um, Food is key, I will tell you that. Beer and wine help. Um, we can also uh, help you put together like a ranked choice voting exercise. You can, I don't know, beer is a great example. Favorite beers, rank your beers, right? Yes. So by ranking them, you can come up with ways to demonstrate what a ranked choice voting exercise would work in, the, in a political world. So I'm um, working on those sorts of things to help us just get the word out and spread um, this movement. I love that. Um, when or do you think that this is something where we'll have on the website eventually? Yes, yes. That people like can very kind of soon. just download. Right, and, right. Okay. The um, uh, honestly, the um, uh, the forms about what you how you can host a party. Mm -hmm. They should already be up there because okay. they're done. Okay. I just haven't figured out how okay. to do it. Okay, awesome. Yes, awesome. yes. So, but we're but a team of us are working on the others in terms of just a a trifold. What is the forward party? How do you get involved with the forward party? What do we stand for? That sort of thing, and that will be done in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that's wonderful because I know people are always oh, asking, waiting. "How yes. do I? How do I host the party?" And right. they're like, "Just go for it." I and know. they're like, "But I want to know. I don't want to do it wrong." And it's yeah. like you can't mess it up. But, but just going for it is hard. I mean, yes. But I do think yes. so uh, I do think that if we we can just like hold our nose and jump, I think it'll be okay, right? <laughs> yes, yes, I love that. Yes, I think so. So, Laura, can you also speak to what? we're doing in the executive committee to build out the, the forward party here in Texas? Part of what we're working on at the forward party and what makes it challenging is that we have to have the infrastructure. We are a political party. And so we need precinct chairs and we need county chairs and we need state leads. So finding those people who are willing to play those roles and do those jobs requires getting the word out so that's what we're in the process of doing. So, we, But we're in the process of building that infrastructure so that we are an honest-to-goodness political party. Where can our guests find you? Uh, what do you want to share with them? What links? Where do you want to send Oh, them? my gosh. I'm totally unprepared for that question as well. I'm, a ho I'm horrible at social media. If you, I can't even remember what my Instagram handle is in my new role. <clears throat> Excuse me, at Joanna Tech, I'm surrounded by young people. They had to identify for me Beyonce one day. Um, I, was, <laughs> I was telling them that I did have an Instagram account. And they said, well, what's your handle? And, oh, I don't know. I assume I have one. And we did find my account, and there's no photo there. So you won't even know if it's really me. Yes. But in any event, I'm at, I'm at uh, L Wheat at wheatinvestments.com and Laura at joannacheck.com should you want to reach out. So. Awesome. Thank you. We will definitely link that up in the okay. show notes for our guests, Thank for you. our viewers. Yes. Um, Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate you. As always, forward this to a friend and like and subscribe. Thank you so much.
Laura, we like to do our lightning round when we can remember. Um, okay. And we, we, I like to put it at the very end, okay. you know, uh, when you've been listening to the podcast and you're like, can you go to the next one? But then you hear... You hear that there's still more. It's always a fun time, right? <laughs> I think they call it teasing, yes, right? Okay. Right. I kind of like to put it out there. But um, so, what's your favorite thing about Texas? People. And have you? Were you born and raised here? No, got here as fast as I could. Okay, <laughs> right answer. Um, your favorite book or movie? Oh gosh, favorite book or movie? This is crazy because I can't even tell you what it was about at this point. But I loved the book A Prayer for Owen Meany. And at the the reason I say that is because I just remember this this tremendous feeling of sadness when the book was over, and this feeling of oh I miss Owen. Oh. So you know it's it's been probably thirty years since I read the book. I need to go back and reread it. Wow, See if a I character, still love it. <laughs> a character that stays with you. Yes, exactly. Um, if you could live anywhere else, you Ooh. know where would it be? Anywhere else. You know, honestly, I'm a, I've got a New York state of mind. I I would I would love to experience New York City, and I know that's not politically correct right now. Everything's everyone says it's just such a mess, but I love that energy. I love the vibe. Yes, yes. yes. just being in the heart of downtown, yes. which is changing now. Apparently, but yes, yes, that's what I hear. Yes, but that's okay. I'm going there tomorrow, so oh. I'll I'll report back. So fun. Um, are you a dog or a cat person? A dog. Um, one word to describe what attracted you to the Ford party. People. <laughs> um, and what's one cause or thing that you want to change in your lifetime or see change yeah. in your lifetime? It would be this. It, it would be bringing, this, bringing the forward party to life where we get away from this world of negativity and name calling and we can just deal with one another in a respectful manner. That wouldn't that be something? That would be amazing. <laughs> I, I hope we see the day. Yes, me too. Thank you so much again, Laura, for coming on. It's been a pleasure to talk Thank to you. Thank you. Loved it. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. Wonderful. So 